Thank you. Next item of business is a debate on motion 15607 in the name of Liz Smith on presumption to mainstream. I can invite those members who wish to take part in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now. And I call on Liz Smith to speak to and move the motion. Ms Smith, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I open this debate with a recognition of and agreement with the OECD's comments in 2012, which stated unequivocally that the principle of inclusion is one of the great strengths of Scottish education. And may I also say that the Scottish Conservatives believe that the presumption to mainstream is part of that inclusive approach, and that for the majority of young people in Scottish schools and their teachers, it has brought rich reward, both in terms of their educational and social experience. Participation in school is not just about what goes on in the classroom, and there are very powerful arguments about why a young person's presence in mainstream provision can be enriched in terms of the development of friendships, the development of wider skills, and in terms of participation in extracurricular activity. Inclusion, however, must never be taken to mean exactly the same thing as mainstreaming. A young person attending a special school, in some cases away from home, may find himself or herself in a very inclusive setting, much better able to meet their potential than they would have done in a mainstream school. And the reverse is true. As the Education Committee report of 2017 found, there are many young people within mainstream schools who do not actually feel particularly well included. So we need to be very careful about the language that we employ. Deputy Presiding Officer, there is no denying the fact that there is a growing number of young people for whom mainstream schooling is not appropriate because it isn't delivering for their best educational and social needs. That was something that the Scottish Government itself acknowledged when it commissioned the Doran Review, which was published in 2012, a report which was in part very critical of the standard of education for some young people with additional support needs, mainly because it was felt that there was a lack of training for teachers to be able to understand and cater for the needs of young people requiring that additional support. Of course, one of the great successes of the 2009 ASN legislation was a significant improvement in the identification of additional support pupils. But thanks to that better identification, the number of ASN young people has doubled, doubled since 2011. Yet at the same time, the number of special schools has declined by 31% since 20, so in 2008. And the number of specialist teachers, including psychologists and psychiatrists, has declined by 9%. 24% of all primary children are now identified with some form of additional support. And the figure for secondary is 29%. And whilst the majority of these young people can flourish in mainstream schools, that is not the case for a significant minority. 60% of teachers are now telling us that young people are frequently being educated in mainstream schools when alternative provision would suit their educational needs much better. In other words, we have seen a very significant rise in the level of demand for specialist education, but as things stand just now, that demand cannot be fully met. For us on these benches, we believe that that is one of the greatest challenges we face in Scottish education. One which is very high on the list of teachers' present concerns in both the primary and the secondary sectors. And one about which many parents and charitable foundations are deeply concerned. And it is for exactly these reasons that we wanted to debate this issue this afternoon. Because we think it is vitally important to pay attention to what teachers are saying. Many are very clear indeed that the current situation is in ways inhibiting their ability to deliver top quality teaching and pastoral care, not only to many young people with the additional support need, but also to many other young people who are in classes where, despite the best intentions of the teacher, they are not receiving the same amount of time as before. And of course, in some cases, there is the accompanying discipline issue. And that is something which naturally both parents and teachers and young people find for themselves is a huge worry. This was partly why the Education and Skills Committee report of 2017 made clear that there are many young people who actually feel more excluded in mainstream schooling than they would do in special schooling, which of course runs slightly counter to what the ASN Act of 29 actually said. But we should not forget that the first quasi-legal criterion which permits exemption from main school mainstream schooling is, and I quote, it would not be suited to the ability or aptitude of the child. So, Deputy Presiding Officer, what do we have to do? Well, let's be very aware that the current financial circumstances made it extremely difficult to find 
new additional resources. And I'm sure we can all agree that it would be very nice to add perhaps another thousand specialist teachers to the workforce, but we have to accept for the time being that that is not practical, local authority budgets are so tight, and we know that the SNP's cut to teacher numbers over many years has also involved a number of classroom assistants who were previously assisting with the support for our most vulnerable children. But let's also be clear that there are some additional resources already within the system. The Cabinet Secretary said just two weeks ago at committee when he admitted that there is an underspend on the attainment fund with money sitting waiting for schools to use. And we know from the early experience of PEF, which we all support across this chamber, that many head teachers are very keen to do more if they can employ additional teachers in that area. And we know too that there are special schools and some specialist units which have available places. We know in Edinburgh, for example, that the Royal Blind School feels that its specialist resources are underused. We know that the Donaldson School feels the same. And I certainly have knowledge of another couple of special schools which would be able to take more young people. And may I say something at this stage, something about the importance of ensuring that there is maximum access to staff who have expertise in ASN work. And in doing so, can I just pick up a comment from the Residential Child Care Qualification Report of 2012, in which the importance of professional qualifications was discussed. All very important in terms of ensuring that there is additional quality within staffing. There is widespread recognition of the need for a qualification-based profession, but there is also very real concern that the narrow focus of the Level 9 degree award is putting in place some restrictions which are first causing, causing potential excellent recruits to the profession to be excluded, and secondly, placing considerable financial burdens on retraining existing staff. That is an issue that we know has arisen in nursery and childcare, but it is also an issue in some of the smaller specialist schools, and it's threatening the viability of some of these institutions. The approach of local authorities is, of course, key to this debate. It's easy to understand why, as a result of financial pressures, they are reluctant to place a young person in a special school, even if they believe that that young person would benefit hugely from being there. And I can certainly cite, I'm sure every member in this chamber can cite several examples from casework whereby a local authority has sought to continue mainstreaming a young person when the parents and specialist um, advice has been otherwise. Specialist care means the provision of specialist services. And if it is not always possible to ensure that these can be provided in a single local authority, then we must ensure that these accessible facilities are elsewhere. And part of that equation, of course, is teacher training. And it's not long ago when the Education Committee took evidence from trainee and probationary teachers that we got exactly the same message, that much more has to be done within teacher training courses to assist all teachers to better understand their responsibilities when it comes to young people and their special needs. And that is something about which I hope the GTCS and the teacher training schools can be helpful. Presiding officer, no one pretends that this is an easy issue. But we do not believe that the current situation can continue if we are to serve the best interests of every child. And I move the motion in my name. Thank you very much. I now call on John Sweeney to speak to move amendment 15607.2. Cabinet Secretary, please. Uh, President Officer, uh, I move the amendment in my name and recognise this is a welcome debate to reaffirm uh, for the government's part, and I'm glad to hear it reaffirmed by the Conservative Party as well, that all children and young people must receive the support that they need to enable them to achieve their full potential. We are clear that all children and young people should learn in the environment which best suits their needs, whether that's a mainstream school or a special school setting. And the judgment about what is appropriate as a learning environment for each individual should be taken based on their needs and their circumstances, and that is the foundation of statute in this area. The defining mission of this government is delivering excellence and equity in Scottish education. Edu equity for all can only be achieved through an inclusive education system. Scotland's inclusive approach celebrates diversity and allows children and young people to develop an understanding and a recognition of differences. This contributes to the development of an increasingly inclusive, compassionate and equal society. This inclusive approach is recognised as a key strength of our education system. And in the OECD report, Quality and Equity of Schooling in Scotland 2007, the OECD recognised that Scotland has 
one of the most equitable school systems in the OECD countries. We are clear in our expectations that all children and young people should reach their full potential within this environment. This is achieved through a framework of legislation and policy which sets the expectation of excellence and equity for all. We have a system which focuses on overcom overcoming barriers to learning, and that is the approach that makes Scotland stand out. The approach is well regarded across Europe and has been adopted by a number of other countries. A cornerstone of our inclusive approach is the presumption of mainstreaming for those with additional support needs, and that approach is reaffirmed in the terms of the amendment that I have just moved. We know that significant numbers of children and young people and their families have benefited from this inclusive approach. There are more than 192,240 pupils who are benefiting from spending some or all of their time in mainstream education. Inclusion is a fundamental aspect of Scottish education and ensures that all children and young people can recognise and appreciate diversity as part of everyday life. Our approach recognises that a child or young person's ability to learn effectively may be impacted in many different ways, from disability or health needs to family circumstances, uh, the learning environment or social and emotional factors. Our focus is that children and young people should receive the support that they need and when they need it. And the explanation there of the range of factors which may affect a young pe person's ability to learn must be reflected in the educational support that is delivered for each individual young person based on the assessment of their needs. We've made extensive policy and legislative changes over the past 15 years to enable those with additional support needs to thrive as part of their class, their school and their wider community. We must continue to make sure that all of our children and young people feel included and can participate and achieve their full potential. Uh, of course. Liz Smith. Uh, could I thank the Cabinet Secretary for taking an intervention? I, I couldn't agree more. I think the Scottish Government has done quite a lot. But given that we have got additional capacity within many of the special schools and special units, what else can the Scottish Government do to encourage local authorities to take up these places? Before you think... respond, Cabinet Secretary, can I just say there is time for intervention, so intervention will make up time. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Well, uh, Liz Smith makes a very fair point because I think the, the judgment about whether to utilise capacity in any special school environment must be driven by the assessment of the needs of an individual young person, and that is by statute a matter for a local authority to take forward. So I think the, 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 the point that I would make in relation to the statutory framework is that I think that uh, framework is there. The, the question that individual local authorities must wrestle with in dialogue with families is what is the most appropriate learning environment for an individual child. Now, of course, Sometimes, and Liz Smith knows that I have familiarity with these concepts, sometimes that can be a matter of dispute between a local authority and a family where uh, families can consider that the local authority's propositions for the learning environment of their child are not appropriate. And ultimately, there are tribunal arrangements that can reconcile some of these differences. But I would encourage, and the government policy encourages this, is good, active, participative dialogue with families to try to make sure that the educational provision that is made available for young people is appropriate. And of course, in certain circumstances, that will involve a reference to a special school. And of course, um, I, I've spent quite a bit of time uh, since I became Education Secretary, visiting all of the special schools in Scotland to see firsthand, because of the implications of issues such as the Doran Review, just the precise nature and character of the services and support that they provide. And I commend them for the work that they do. Um, but fundamentally, uh, the judgments rest with local authorities in dialogue with families as to what should be the, um, uh, the appropriate educational environment for young people. So, President Officer, we, we, we know that we have a system uh, in Scotland that is much admired and that uh, there is much to be proud about. But I would be the first to accept that no system is entirely perfect. And I'm uh, very committed to ensuring that children receive the support that they need when they need it within our education system. Um, we have appreciated and valued the input into this discussion from the Education and Skills Committee, and we will continue to work to ensure that children and young people's needs are identified, that they are met, and that we will do all that we can to make sure 
that those who provide support directly to children and young people have the skills and knowledge to enable them to do this in the most appropriate way. And of course, that includes the importance attached to initial teacher education into the bargain, uh, which must reflect some of these challenges. Uh, there is still more that needs to be done to advance uh, many of these questions and to assure ourselves within the context of reaffirming the principle of mainstreaming that all that needs to be done um, is being done. So we're looking to further support implementation of additional support for learning and the, the programme for government sets out our commitment to work with local government towards improving consistency of support across Scotland through improved guidance by building further capacity to deliver effective additional support and improving career pathways and professional development, including new training resources for school staff on inclusive practices. Um, and I'm very pleased to consider the question of a review of the implementation of additional support for learning, um, including where children learn, taking a collaborative approach and working with local authorities and the third sector, I believe we can create a, a Scotland where our education system can match up to our aspirations and ensure... Uh, the an Cabinet Secretary is actually, at this very moment, about to conclude. Oh, well, well if, I, if I wasn't about I'd to I'd put conclude, that really I nicely. Certainly am, I certainly am now. Uh, I very happily give way to the member in my closing remarks. Uh, I know the commitment to inclusive education is shared across the Chamber, and we must improve experiences for all, ensuring that we are getting it right for every child. I hope the next steps that I've set out today will help us to take Actually, that I meant further you should journey finish. and, uh, and <laughs> towards secretary. delivering inclusive education in practice for all children and young people Thank in Scotland. Thank you. I mean, I do have some time in hand, but it's not an enormous amount. Uh, can I call on Ian Gray now to speak to and move Amendment 15607.1? Mr Gray, please. Thank you very much, uh, President Officer. I rise to move the amendment uh, in my name. I think I've uh, explained to the Chamber before that um, I'm committed to the presumption uh, of mainstreaming, not just by ideology, uh, but by experience, because many, many years ago, uh, when I taught in Grace Mount High School, it was co-located with uh, Kames, what was then uh, Kames School for the Visually Impaired, with the, the very purpose of ensuring that uh, Kames students could spend a significant part of their school week in mainstream classes in the high school and it worked extremely well. We had small classes, practical classes of around 12 to 14, perhaps two uh, pupils from Kames and they often came uh, with specialist support from uh, Kames school as well. It worked extremely well. It was a very inclusive setup. Uh, so I've seen mainstreaming work, but unfortunately I've seen it fail uh, as well because over the years, uh, at that time, late 70s, early 80s, budgetary pressure began to bite. Uh, and then we find ourselves in uh, full classes, over 20 uh, for science classes, perhaps four or even five pupils from Came School uh, and no uh, additional support teacher coming with them. They did not get the education to which they were entitled. They were essentially parked at the back of the, the class and I admit it, uh, ignored. So this is very much in my view, uh, the right policy. It's the right policy for children themselves uh, and their educational experience is the right policy for parents, children being educated uh, in their local school. But it is also the right policy for other children in the school whose educational experience is enriched. Uh, and uh, as the Cabinet Secretary said, the right policy for society too, in building a compassionate, fair uh, and equitable society. But without resources and specialist expertise, and sometimes that does mean, as Liz Smith said, actual specialist provision, it is not really a policy at all. In fact, it's rather a, a, a con, a fraud, uh, on those children and their parents, as it was for children who came from all across Lothians in these days uh, to attend came school uh, and then came through into Grace Mountain High where they did not receive the support uh, that they were entitled to. So the question I suppose is, we have the policy of presumption uh, for mainstreaming today, do we have the resources? Uh, and I think the answer is clearly that we don't. Uh, year on year cuts to local government uh, have taken their toll, as Liz Smith said, uh, and as she also pointed out, since 2012, we've seen an increase of some 68%, in fact, in uh, pupils identified with additional support needs, and in the same period, 500 fewer trained ASN teachers. Look, 
Mainstreaming can still be great. I, I, only a week or so ago, I visited the Royal Blind School to talk to them about uh, the gloriously named Elvis, the East Lothian Visual Impairment Service, where their staff uh, work with uh, some 56 children in mainstream education uh, in East Lothian. And that is a great scheme. But we are the only local authority in the whole of Scotland who actually use that expertise in that way. And in the Royal Blind School, uh, as Liz Smith suggested, there are now only 28 pupils. Now, with over 4,000 children uh, with visual impairment across Scotland, I simply don't believe uh, that that is uh, all of the pupils who could benefit from the expertise there. And of course, it's not just uh, about those with visual impairments. It's not very long since uh, uh, we did consider, and I know the Cabinet Secretary is seriously considering uh, this report, not included, not engaged, not involved, which talked about children with autism, for too many of whom uh, mainstream turns into not a rich educational experience, but rather a cycle of part-time schooling, informal and then perhaps formal exclusion. That is not uh, good I'm enough. afraid you must conclude, so, Mr Green. So, with regard to the motions, the Tory motion, in our view, is uh, not committed, perhaps, enough uh, to mainstreaming. The government motion, I think, corrects that, and we will support it. But neither of them say enough about the importance of resources. So, we will press our amendment this evening. Thank you very much. Uh, call Alec Cole Hamilton, please. Thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I start by declaring an interest in that my wife heads up the support for learning in a primary school in Edinburgh. I was also extensively involved around the work uh, towards the 2004 Additional Support for Learning Act and its implementation. And it's there I want to start because I think in that piece of legislation there is a line which for me is one of the most elegant pieces of prose in any statute passed by this Parliament. A child or young person has additional support needs for the purposes of this Act for whatever reason the child or young person is or is, un is likely to be unable without the provision of additional support to benefit from school education. For whatever reason, it's that catch-all intent that I think also captures the universal and unalienable right uh, to education. And, and whilst that is very much, uh, I think, the will of all of this parliament, it is, uh, for whatever reason, that picture is becoming bleaker and bleaker. We are 500 fewer teachers than we had in 2012 who had additional support needs training. Um, one third of parents who have a, a, an additional support needs child have uh, say, state that their child has been unlawfully expelled. And in my own constituency, I come up on a weekly basis with parents um, who have children who have complex needs in the classroom who are not finding that they are receiving the support and in some cases offering to privately fund the support and being turned away because of a policy that doesn't exist where uh, teachers say we're having too many adults in the classroom. I think there is definitely a disconnect between the goodwill expressed and the policies we passed in this chamber and the debates we've had in this chamber um, and something happening on the ground. We can see that in uh, the metrics. There is a four times higher exclusion rate in the additional support needs population within the school, yet additional support for learning only tracks something like 12% of the overall spend in education. There are broken lines of communication, in some cases siloed working, and I'm particularly reminded of the case of the Muir family. They've given me their permission to use their, their family name, um, where I had to help them lodge a Section 70 complaint um, over the fact that there had been an element of drift whereby because their child who has autism wasn't receiving the support he needed but was very disruptive in class there was an element of drift to the point where nothing was really done to help him uh, until he had passed beyond uh, the age of 16 at which the, the state no longer has an obligation to provide that education. Um, getting support to, kid, to kids is a problem, it can be a problem, and that starts with identification. There's huge delays, as we know, in the diagnostic process. Huge delays also in things like Section 23 assessments. Upon diagnosis, they go back to yet another long queue. Families go back to the end of a, another long queue in terms of ascertaining the level of support that the local authority may be prepared to provide. And there's a huge, huge failure, as we know, in identifying hidden additional support needs, looked after young people who exhibit attachment disorders the trauma and loss, uh, their behaviour is not managed in, this, in the way that it often might be. And indeed with young carers, many young carers don't, aren't aware of their additional support needs um, or the needs of their families. So the, the picture is bleak. 78% um, of teachers surveyed by a EIS say that there aren't enough 
additional support provision. And there was one quote on an, a prominent education blog where one teacher said, I feel inclusion is a massive stick to beat me with. Teacher training never prepared me for this. That doesn't speak to whether the policy are right or wrong. It's just we're not implementing it as we should do with the right resources. Because the concept isn't wrong. Universalism is important because education is a right regardless of capacity or communication skills. Integration is both a social leveler and it can be very therapeutic, but it needs to be backed up with proper training and resources. Thank you. Thank you very much. We now move to the open debate. Speeches of four minutes. Alison Harris, followed by Claire Adamson. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Like many subjects in the education portfolio, the topic of today's debate is that of a well-intentioned policy that once again has not been fully thought through when it comes to implementation. The presumption of mainstreaming has been a part of Scottish Government policy since the year 2000 and has going, grown increasingly central to the ideology surrounding the teaching of children with additional support needs, or ASN. The arguments in favour of mainstreaming point to the social and academic benefits for ASN children and indeed the positives of other children learning the importance of inclusion at an early age. However, the evidence in Scotland points to the conclusion that it is failing too many children. Professor Lanny Florian of Edinburgh University, an ardent supporter of mainstreaming, said, we cannot dismiss the concerns of parents and teachers who feel that, th that things are not working for too many children. The problem is that mainstreaming all children only works if there is an adequate support for teachers in its delivery. In December 2018, a Scottish Government publication stated that 28.7% of the school population had additional support needs. In contrast, though, between 2012 and 2016, there was a 12% fall in the number of additional support for staff learning. This is simply not sustainable. Other members have rightly highlighted the damaging effects of this for children, but it's also important to note the impact on teachers and staff. Teachers have written a series of letters to the Scottish Government highlighting their concerns. One letter said that the class teacher was hit, kicked, punched, and the support staff were repeatedly subject to kicks to the stomach and being bitten. In the Scotsman last February, one teacher described their colleagues as beyond breaking point and said that the policy was increasing staff mental health problems. I don't think anyone would think this is okay. Who would want to come to work with the threat of chairs and scissors being thrown at them or being bitten and kicked? Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, though, this is what we're hearing in schools time and time again. In many cases, a teacher's whole day is spent focusing on the additional support needs of one or two children mm -hmm. to the detriment of every child in the class. I recently asked the Cabinet Secretary what action he was taking to reduce teacher workload in Falkirk. His response highlighted access to streamlined online resources and toolkits to tackle administrative bureaucracy. But these measures don't address the root of the problem. They just attempt to manage the symptoms. The Cabinet Secretary then said it is the local authority's responsibility to ensure workload demands on teachers are minimised. But local authorities are having to make cuts across the board, so this seems like an impossible task. The Education Committee recently heard evidence from the Scottish Government regarding its updated data collection methods. The result in additional support staff no longer being counted as a distinct group, meaning their numbers cannot as easily be identified or tracked. If we are no longer collecting the correct data, then we have no method of truly deciphering just how bad the problem is for teachers, staff and ultimately children. The positives of mainstreaming are undeniable, but right now, for far too many children, it's just not working. And that is why I will be supporting the motion in the name of Liz Smith this afternoon. Thank you. Claire Adamson, followed by Johan Lamott. Thank you, presiding officer. This is a very important debate to be having this afternoon. And uh, I thank Liz Smith for her remarks about inclusion, about the presumption of mainstreaming and how important that is for young people. Um, Liz mentioned, how, Ms Smith rather mentioned, mentioned how the increase in the number of um, people being identified with additional support 
needs had increased greatly. I believe from committee this morning, hearing P P Professor Hargreaves talk about his work in Canada, that in Canada it's actually a rate of over 50%. So it could be that we have more work to do and we shouldn't be afraid of that because identifying additional support needs is about achieving that equity that the Cabinet Secretary <coughs> spoke about. Uh, I wasn't on the committee, um, Education and Skills Committee in 2017 when they published how is additional support for learning working in practice, but I know since joining that how much that is a priority for the members of the committee and how they have embedded ASN work into all of the work that we're doing. Indeed, in the budget debate last week, it was one of the areas that I highlighted that the committee uh, had concerns about. Um, I welcome uh, Mr Gray bringing in the issue of um, the special schools and indeed we visited as a committee the Royal Blind School and saw some moving and excellent work. I was lucky enough to meet, meet a Pushkin Prize winner who was going off to university this year um, to study to become a writer and um, it's, it's absolutely true special schools have an important part to play but it also has to work hand in hand with identifying an appropriate environment that is identified for each and every child individually. And only then will we achieve that equity that the Cabinet Secretary had spoken about. Uh, um, Ms Harris isn't a, a member of the committee and I know she talked about the collection of data. Um, I would like to speak about that because I think this is very important because we are in danger of conflating ASN teachers with ASN support staff and we have to be very careful about our language around this. Uh, Mick Wilson, who was Acting Deputy Director of Education Analysis Scotland at our committee, he um, in, in inquiry said, I think that at the level of detail at which the data is collected, the descriptions of ASN auxiliary and care assistant, the two, two categories that were there, that we had in the past do not match with the staff that authorities have in place now. And because there was no pupil support assistant option to allow local authorities to return in the data collection, authorities were randomly allocating the pupil support assistant cat to any one of those categories. So it's not that we're not collecting the data, and um, the data was never collected in an efficient and, and in a manner that would have really fed into informing about this area. And I think that's something I think the Cabinet Secretary is reflecting on at the moment um, so because people could be doing a role in a different authority with completely different job descriptions and I think um, the theme from what I've been hearing today is that this will be in about partnership working this is something that we'll have to work very very closely with education authorities and with COSLA and local authorities to achieve and that's another area that will need consensus from local authorities on how um, the job descriptions and the job titles and how they're actually describing their support staff in schools. Um, I was also very here, very glad to hear about the, the change in the guidance um, from Alex Cole Hamilton. Um, uh, and this was a, an important piece of guidance issued by the government. And it sets out clearly the responsibility of councils in relation to the, the plans and the criteria that must be considered for implementing plans for young people to ensure that each and every child gets the appropriate support to indeed let them, as the Cabinet Secretary said, reach their full potential. Thank you, President. Joanne Lamont, followed by Jeremy Balfour. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. This is obviously a very short debate, and perhaps one of the upsides is that therefore I'll be making a very short speech. Um, I will make some brief observations, but given the lack of debating time given by the Scottish Government to education and to this critical issue in particular, I would seek a commitment from the Cabinet Secretary to provide substantial debating time soon to allow the detail of this policy, its purpose and effectiveness to be explored in more depth. I think we're all agreed on the basics, but I think there is a more substantial and perhaps more nuanced debate that we need to have um, in, if we have a bit more time to do it. My starting point is a simple one. I support the presumption to mainstream education as a matter of equity and fairness to young people with special educational needs but also as a matter of benefit for all young people. And I've been privileged to, to go on a regular basis to Ro Ross Hall Academy and to Darnley Primary School, both of which have visual impairment units. And I believe that's a benefit to all young people to share their experience of learning. And it is, I believe, a means of breaking down the barriers to division and discrimination that all too many disabled people face throughout the remainder of their lives. But to be clear, a policy commitment is not just stating it. A policy to mainstream is not a policy if the appropriate resources are not made available. 
if the appropriate training for teaching staff and support staff is not there, if there is not meaningful support to overcome not just the physical barriers that some young people may face, but all of the barriers that present young people with huge challenges in achieving their potential. It's not a policy commitment if there's not proper monitoring of its implementation and its impact. And as already been referenced, we in committee have looked at the lack of information about the skills um, and abilities of those supporting young people in our schools. We know that charities, the unions, amongst others, carers and parents have all produced reports that talk about, um, all too often talk a means, about a mainstream place which is honoured in the breach as being a part-time timetable, as time spent out of class, unlike their peers, spent outside the head teacher's door, where there is, at the, the more extreme end, inappropriate e exclusion. In those circumstances, we have mainstream only in name, and I don't think anyone in this chamber would want simply to aspire to that. It's essential to confront something pretty basic that is going on in the system. All the evidence tells us that there is a stark lack of resource to will the means to make mainstreaming real in the lives of our young people. And that has got consequences. I am deeply troubled that this has led not just to concerns about how best to meet the needs of young people with additional support needs, but a serious questioning of the policy itself and a consequent danger of blaming the young people with additional support needs for being the problem. We cannot allow that attitude to develop, but those who are saying there are challenges, they need to be supported in understanding how those challenges properly can be met. We can't ignore them by saying, well, you don't care about the policy. It is essential that we are part of willing the means. In conclusion, I would also want to reflect on how I believe the policy has been distorted. I recall when parents campaigned for and sought a presumption in favour of mainstream education. In a number of cases, we now see an assumption of mainstream education, even the family and those supporting the child believe this to be inappropriate. And that has consequences too. An inappropriate placement where we set up young people to fail. A reduction also in the specialist places and the specialism that many young people require, so that even if they're assessed as needing a place out of mainstream, those places are not available. It cannot be acceptable that even where there are places available, local authorities are having to decide not to use them because of the cost of that placement, rather than an absolute objective assessment of the needs of the child. We know across this chamber that that is not you accessible. You must close now, please. We should, in conclusion, recall why parents and others saw a presumption of mainstream. They seek not warm words from us, but the proper effective support for the young people, wherever they are You must in close order now, please. To achieve their education potential. Can I remind members that the, we are short of time for this debate, and generally speeches only have one conclusion. Um, and can I go to Jeremy Balfour to be followed by Jenny, by Jenny Gorris. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Providing Officer, and uh, I welcome this debate. Um, as I've said um, in previous debates around this area, back, back in the dark ages, uh, when I started school, uh, my parents made the choice uh, for me to go to mainstream, which back in the uh, early 70s was perhaps not the choice made by the majority. And I do welcome the steps that have been made uh, by this government and by previous um, administrations uh, to allow mainstreaming to become far more normative for those who have either physical or, or learning difficulties. But I do think this is an important debate and an important uh, motion that we will vote on uh, later this afternoon. Because I do think we need some kind of review to see where things are um, and how things can be improved. Somebody contacted me when they knew this debate uh, was taking place. This is their story. They have a child who is in primary five. They are present in mainstream school, but she has requested that her son is taken out of it. The reason for that is that he spends 90% of his time out of the classroom working independently with an adult. He doesn't have any friends. He feels lonely, isolated, and hates going to school. Can I suggest, Deputy President, President Officer, that is the time when mainstreaming has gone too far. 
when we're not looking at every child, looking at his or her needs. Because yes, we go to school to learn, that is a primary reason. But actually, there are lots of other reasons that we go to school as well. We have an emotional development. We have a social development. And if people are being excluded from the classroom, if they are even worse, standing alone in the playground every break time, then they are missing out. And that is why I think simply to review and see is every child really getting the education they should is welcome. But can I pick up um, another theme um, already outlined by Alison Harris? Because I think we have to look at this holistically as well. Because often um, a child in a classroom can disturb other children. Now that doesn't mean they should be excluded. We need to have the appropriate support for that child. But I know, having spoken to many teachers, that they are firefighting in the classroom. That they feel more like policemen than teachers because they are having to control what is going on. And I think there is a danger that we can have this debate in this uh, pleasant surroundings. But as I'm sure others have experienced, either through personal experience, talking to teachers, talking to parents, what is happening at the core face is often very different from what we express or what we see. Yes, I, I fully accept that mainstreaming should be the preferred choice. But it shouldn't be the choice that parents and children are forced down to because of bad decisions made, made by local authorities, either on financial grounds or on ideological grounds. And, and I do think there is room and opportunity for places like here in Edinburgh for the blind school to continue to develop and to give that support. And that's why I will be supporting the motion in Liv Smith's name this afternoon. Thank you. Jenny Goldruth, followed by Mark MacDonald. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I'm grateful to the Conservatives for bringing today's motion forward on the presumption to mainstream. And I would agree with Claire Adamson on the importance of the subject of today's debate. And with Joanne Lamont, uh, my only criticism would be that we don't have a full debate uh, here today because I know the Education Committee has looked at this issue in great detail. So 2004 gives us the backdrop to the policy, a very different political landscape, consensus in Scottish education, the Additional Support for Learning Act. Not the language of disability, this legislation and the language it enshrined was truly groundbreaking 15 years ago. But none of us can deny that the ASL Act fundamentally challenged traditional expectations of Scotland's teachers and schools. It put pressure on local authorities to accommodate learning needs which had never before been considered in the mainstream. It put pressure on teachers to properly equip themselves with the training required. Fundamentally, however, it put pressure on education authorities to work to get it right for every child. Now, to do that properly, our schools had to start taking seriously their legal requirements to assess the needs of the children in their care. The evidence bears truth, a 153% increase in the numbers of pupils recorded with an additional support need since 2010. Our children are more readily assessed for support, and this is being done at an earlier stage in their school journey than ever before. Conversely, since 2002, the number of pupils in special schools has fallen by 19%, compared to a 4% drop in the numbers of pupils in mainstream primary schools. Today, 97% of children in Scotland schools with an additional support need are educated in mainstream education. The government's review into the presumption of mainstreaming is nonetheless timely, particularly given recent developments in Scottish education. And I note the government is to report on the implementation of additional support for learning nationally in due course. Now, classroom assistants are a vital part of the education system. They support some of our most vulnerable pupils. Last, uh, last August, the Herald reported on an overall increase in classroom and support staff from 12,992 to 13,761. Um, that's good news, but the same article goes on to consider behaviour support where posts have reduced. Um, now, as a former teacher, I think that part of that is about a cultural shift in our schools away from disciplinary behaviour support bases to enforcing positive behaviour by the use of restorative practices. And listening to Alex Cole Hamilton um, with the story of his constituent certainly reminded me and some members might remember this story uh, of a boy called Jamie that I once taught. Now, Jamie was regularly removed from classes uh, across the school. Every day he was sent to the deputy head. Uh, he would sit outside the deputy head's uh, classroom and he would sit with a jotter and doodle away to his heart's content. 
one free period, uh, I remember sitting down with Jamie uh, in a very public place and, and asking him how he was. He'd been removed from his home. He'd been sent away to live with his grandparents who lived much further away from the school. So school really was a salvation for Jamie. It was the one constant in his life. And when Jamie arrived, he was promptly removed from classes for his disruptive behaviour. Uh, I texted my former colleagues and friends ahead of today's debate and I was delighted to hear that Jamie's desk is no longer there. Presiding officer, our teachers are professionals. Every single one of them is trained to support pupils with an additional support need or needs. That is a core part of initial teacher education and I take issue with Jeremy Balfour's comments with regard to policing the classroom. That's certainly not why I came into education nor why any of my colleagues came into education. They come in to make a difference to children's lives. That's a very different uh, picture from the one painted we heard earlier. It should also be said that throughout the mm -hmm. academic Members year, just our teachers must evidence 35 hours of continuing professional development. And for many, that time is used to hone their skills by focusing their training on the pupils in their care. Presiding officer, children's needs are not fixed. Conversely, our teachers' training requirements will change over time to reflect the children in front of them. Good local authorities know this. Good local authorities provide and promote training opportunities to ensure this continuous improvement in the profession. Good teachers know that simply passing your teacher training or completing your probation is only part of that journey. The government amendment today recommits to a continuing commitment to a presumption to mainstream, and I hope that that is a shared perspective across the chamber. Um, but as Liz Smith alluded to, however, we should be honest that there have been challenges in implementing mainstreaming for all pupils, because all pupils' needs are unique, and many of our schools simply were not built to accommodate children with additional support needs. You that must is a close, fact, please. and I know from experience uh, it remains a challenge. Thank you. Mark MacDonald, followed by Bob Doris. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I declare at the beginning of this debate that I'm a parent of a child with additional support needs. My son has a diagnosis of autistic spectrum disorder. Um, it was just over three years ago today that I asked a question of the then uh, Minister Alistair Allen uh, as to whether the Scottish Government would consider a review uh, into the presumption of mainstreaming because of concerns which I had been receiving about how it was being applied in practice and that was committed to and I understand that review uh, is ongoing. Uh, I would echo the point that Joanne Lamott made that perhaps we would benefit from a, a longer debate which would allow for longer speeches with perhaps more nuanced contribution, although I do think the contributions up till now have been broadly very good uh, in that respect um, and perhaps that's something that can come at the end of that review process. I think when we talk about additional support needs in this chamber we must remember that when we refer to an additional support need that covers a very wide spectrum in relation to needs. Some of those needs will be uh, transient in nature, some of them will require very minimal support uh, and some will require only short-term support but others will require intensive and ongoing support but it's important to remember when we talk about percentages and figures that those figures cover a very broad spectrum in relation to need but this debate I think is rightly focused on those uh, children with the highest tariffs of need uh, and those children for whom uh, perhaps the the support is not per being provided that ought to be and that I think is about a question that, that arises around consistency because it would be fair to say that even within different local authorities, there is variability of how uh, children with additional support needs are being supported by different schools and indeed even within different classrooms. And that sometimes comes down to uh, an ethos of an individual school or an approach of an individual teacher, often inspired by training which they have undertaken or a course which they have been on. And I think the challenge that we face is how we get from that situation of pockets of best practice to one which delivers a culture of best practice. The point I made in the uh, debate which Daniel Johnson held before is that the key to GERFEC is the word every. It's not about getting it right for the majority of children, it's about getting it right for every child. So if there are children for whom the system is not working properly, we must work to make sure that the system does work for them. Because it doesn't just impact on that child alone, although they should be the central focus of our attention. It has a wider impact on that child's family, uh, on the other pupils within the class in which that child is being educated, and on the teachers and staff in the class and the wider school uh, in which that child is being educated as well. And it's important to note that families and parents who come to myself and I suspect to other members in relation to their surgeries where cases uh, have arisen where, where things have fallen uh, down uh, often feel that they are ignored and sidelined and are not included properly as partners in their child's education because we must remember that parents should be seen as partners given the important role 
that home has as well as school in that child's educational performance. But too many parents feel that their concerns are not taken on board, are not addressed properly or are dismissed out of hand. And that is something I think that needs to be reflected upon. And, and a final point I would want to make, and one which perhaps hasn't yet been brought up in relation to the debate, is about how we manage transitions uh, for children, uh, whether that is from early years to primary, from primary to secondary, or from secondary to further higher education or work after school. These are very different environments that children are moving from and into. And if the transitions are not managed appropriately and the changes that they are going to experience are not properly explained uh, and catered for, those children can find that while they have coped perfectly well in a mainstream environment in one uh, educational setting, it can all fall down very quickly in another educational setting because those, cha those changes are not suitably planned for. I would say that uh, in relation to my own constituency, I would encourage the Cabinet Secretary, I have written to him about whether he would consider coming to visit Orchard Bray, which is the 3 to 18 campus that Aberdeen City Council have set up uh, for specialist education, which looks uh, very clearly at that whole life journey and preparing for appropriate transitions. But I would just finish on one quote, Presiding Officer, uh, from Charlene Tate of Scottish Autism, who tweeted recently uh, a sentiment that I think sums up how this debate should be framed. Inclusion is about how you feel, not about how you sit next to, and that should be the guiding principle which flows through this debate. The last of the open debate contributions is from Bob Doris. Um, thank you, President Officer. Let me begin by acknowledging the constructive manner by which Liz Smith has raised this very important issue here this afternoon. I also absolutely agree that we must distinguish between inclusion and mainstreaming. They can be the same thing, but they're not always the same thing. Mainstreaming without the support required is counterproductive to a young person, their family, and a wider learning community within that school. Mainstreaming without the required support also drives up demand for specialist schools by some young people who may potentially be well served and flourish in a mainstream inclusive setting, but only if the correct support is actually there. I welcome the Scottish Government funds available, I'll say more about that in a second, and the soon to be published revised guidance to councils to drive up consistency and standards across all local authorities. Uh, I would ask how that guidance will actually be monitored once it's implemented uh, and how councils are actually audited and how they perform in relation to that guidance or else it just simply becomes guidance sitting on a shelf. I think Joanne Lamb and Claire Adamson raised some very important points about how we monitor and capture the information out there and the challenges around that. I think briefly on resources, let's just be honest, they are finite and we can certainly do with more. That's self-evident. Uh, different councils place different levels of priority and investment on inclusive mainstreaming and specialist school provision, which we must remember is also a valued part of the wider school estate. So we want national consistency. In some areas, it's easier to get an assessment than other areas via the local authority and the NHS. So it's difficult to actually ascertain the level of additional support needs in, in different local authorities. We're not always comparing apples with apples. How does all of this feed into the funding formula for local authorities or health boards? If we do start picking up that funding formula, then I have to say sometimes port barrel politics in terms of how money is moved across the various regions and local authorities of Scotland comes into it through self-interest. There should be no self-interest when looking at additional support needs. The interest is the best for the young person and their families, and we all talk about local flexibility. Well, I have to say, if we're going to get national standards, there could be constraints on councils. Let's just acknowledge that. Um, I want to uh, use the second half of my speech in relation to a mum I met, I met this morning, I know her quite well. Uh, I have a primary seven child who is on the autistic spectrum. Um, this woman has got a skill set and a determination and a knowledge to fight for her son's rights, and she certainly does and succeeds in that. Her son is now approaching a vital transition period, attending a specialist school in a co-located campus. Her son hopes to attend a mainstream secondary, uh, but with a special support unit uh, within it. Uh, whilst um, mum would have preferred a, a secondary school with a more local support unit, she, th there's that certainty there over where her son would go. But however, Glasgow City Council has decided to move that support unit from one secondary school to another secondary school, um, it's unclear how many staff will be redeployed to that second school. It's unclear what the structure of the support unit will be like. And that young person and his family need certainty in relation to planning for their transition, which could potentially 
be undermined. So I just wanted to raise that here today because it's not just about the quality of provision in our schools, of course it is, it's also about planning for transition eh, for young people and their families. And when we do seek to improve, reform, update, advance, progress, whatever system we have across 32 local authorities, we have to do it with the wider community and we have to do it for the long term and make sure the voices of those living with autism and other additional support needs and their families are at the heart of that. So in important aspects such as transitions, families don't lose out. We move to the closing speeches. I call Mary Fee for up to four minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I welcome today's debate to re reaffirm our support for mainstreaming, support that's been shown from all of the speakers um, in this debate this afternoon. Presumption to mainstream is an important feature of our education system, benefiting children with additional support needs, creating a more inclusive system for all. And can I thank Inclusion Scotland and Enable Scotland for their very informative briefings ahead of today's debate. And my closing remarks will focus on some of the issues that they have raised in their, their briefings. And I'll reflect on the challenges that have been highlighted by Inclusion and Enable to give an extra voice for the people these organisations represent. One of the main challenges for schools with mainstreaming is resourcing. That's why we've tabled an amendment to reflect the impact that cuts have had on promoting and maintaining mainstreaming. Mainstreaming in itself does not necessarily mean inclusive education. Cuts to learning support staff, including teachers and other support workers, will further disadvantage disabled pupils and restrict their full inclusion. Not my words, but the view of Inclusion Scotland. 122 specialist teachers have been lost since 2014, whilst the number of pupils with additional support needs has risen by more than 40,000. And that is simply unacceptable. It's unacceptable for children with additional support needs, unacceptable for other pupils, and unacceptable for teaching staff facing further pressures to support all of Scotland's children. And a recent EIS survey revealed that 52% of teachers say supporting pupils with additional support needs has caused stress in the last 12 months. And when asked to, to agree or disagree with the following statement, the provision for children and young people with additional support needs is adequate in my school, over 78% of teachers disagreed with 42% of teachers strongly disagreeing. This is the view of the teachers that are working in our classrooms each and every day, meaning that children with additional support needs are not being given the education they need to learn and prosper. Inclusion Scotland revealed that over 10% of school leavers with additional support needs leave school with no qualifications at SQVF level three, compared to less than 2% of children with no additional support needs. And simply being present in a mainstream classroom does not mean that you are included. Again, not my words, but those of Enable. To ensure that mainstreaming works for children with additional support needs, there must be quicker and effective assessment of their needs. If not, we continue to create barriers for many children with additional support needs to be included and to be actively involved. And once more, this all comes down to staffing and resourcing. And the Conservative motion fails to address the issue of funding in our schools and instead seeks a regressive step that could be punitive to children who could prosper with mainstreaming, but only if the right resources are in place. And, presiding officer, we should all support the presumption to mainstream. It supports inclusion and has benefits for children with additional support needs. Otherwise, we could go backwards in separating children from their peers, creating divisions and creating more barriers. Thank you. I call John Swinney for up to four minutes, please, Cabinet Secretary. 
President Officer, uh, this has been a, a helpful debate and I'll try to respond positively to the call from Joanne Lamont for more debating time to consider this uh, issue, uh, echoed by Mr Macdonald and also um, I'll look at the invitation from Mr Macdonald to, to visit the Orchard Bray campus, which sounds like a fascinating uh, facility to meet the needs of young people. Um, I, I aim to do that as quickly as I can. Um, Joanne Lamont mentioned the issue, and Mary Fee touched on it in her closing remarks, about the impact, the outcomes of what are achieved. And I think it is important to put on the record what is actually achieved by young people with additional support support needs in mainstream education. 69% of school leavers in 2016-17 with additional support needs left school with one or more qualification at SCQF level 5 or better. That was an increase of 13.8% since 2011-12, which I think demonstrates on one measure the effectiveness of the mainstreaming approach. 65.2% um, of 2016-17 uh, school levels, including special school pupils with additional support needs, attained one or more qualifications at that level, which was an increase of 10 percentage points since 2011-12. So we do look very carefully, and indeed also, at positive destinations, where positive destinations have increased for pupils with additional support needs by 5 percentage points between 2011-12 and 2016-17. So there are achievements being made by young people um, uh, through mainstream education, and I think that's something we should see. But of course, I'll give way. Rachel Hamilton. Secretary, for taking my intervention. You've um, actually touched on a point that I wanted to um, ask you about, and that was that my, one of my constituents came to see me, quite a distressed um, mother, about her autistic son who's not receiving um, sufficient support at high school. Um, he, he can't cope because he has stress and anxiety whilst um, doing his uh, NAT4 exams and the curriculum. And I just wondered if the Cabinet Secretary believed that um, the colleges sector can play uh, a key role in delivering um, a more practical skills and learning experience for young people with autism. Could I remind members that in short speeches, long interventions are not always that, useful? That, John that, Swinney. That, that may well be a possibility for, for, for the individual concerned, and I would encourage, as I responded to Liz Smith in my uh, earlier speech, um, for dialogue between the family and the local authority about this question, because we have to make sure a judgment is made about what is the correct educational setting for every young person. Now, the issue of resources has been touched on in the debate, and as I've told Parliament before, um, the resources spent on additional support for learning increased from £584 million in 2015-16, um, uh, an increase by, of 2.3% in real terms, 4.5% in cash terms. Uh, but I'm conscious of the significance of resources, but I, I don't want to strike a discordant note at the end of my speech, but it is a little bit incredible for Alison Harris to give us lessons about resources when her party supports a policy position of reducing the amount of money available to the public finances because of the tax position that they support in this parliament. So it is, and of course tomorrow we'll see whether or not the Conservatives will support any money being allocated to the public services through the passage of the budget. If I can conclude on the uh, points raised by Jenny Gilruth, who I thought put the changes in our education system as a result of the passage of the Additional Support for Learning Act into their proper context in the classroom, as we might expect from a former teacher. The, what Jenny Gilruth illustrated was the change in the approach to education that has come about by the, 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 the benefits and the advantages of inclusion. It has required adaptations in teaching practice. It has adapted uh, it required adaptation within our education system, but the education of our young people is the better for having a mainstreaming approach of an inclusive commitment within Scottish education, and the government's committed to maintaining that. I now call on Oliver Mundell to wind up the debate for up to five minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to close this debate today on behalf of the Scottish Conservatives, uh, because I do believe it is incredibly important that we do talk about these issues here in this chamber. Um, and I'm pleased that the Cabinet Secretary has picked up on the strong hint uh, from a number of members that we would like to discuss uh, these issues more on government time. Mm -hmm. Often, um, I think it's uh, difficult because as a collective, as a society, as a parliament, and I'd say very gently, as a government, as local authorities, as individual schools, it's often very difficult to say the truth out loud. Mm 
and that is uh, that we're not getting it right for every young person in Scotland. Our education system as it currently stands is failing a small uh, but significant group of young people yeah. and I think that we have to be honest enough with ourselves and I find it very difficult when I speak to constituents who are experiencing exactly these difficulties to explain to them uh, why the system's letting them down uh, so badly and I do welcome uh, the tone from other members and the cabinet secretary in that context today. Inclusion is so important um, but it's not just about being present in the classroom or even the school building as many have said and we've got to uh, redouble our efforts to make sure that the reality matches up with the rhetoric uh, for many of the young people and parents that we're here to represent. And I think Bob Doris uh, made an important point about the variability across Scotland. I can only speak for my own local authority area, uh, but if uh, there are similar pro problems uh, elsewhere, uh, then I think it does point, um, and members must see in their own mailbags, that there is uh, systematic issues here, and I think we've heard that today. Um, we know for a fact that current practices um, are just not good enough. Uh, we know uh, that uh, the expertise and support is in fact out there. We've got lots of uh, very talented people in our education system, lots of specialist provision uh, that, as others have said, could be better uh, used. Uh, but I would uh, join uh, Ian Gray in drawing uh, reference uh, to the work done by a number of autism uh, charities um, recently, uh, which has highlighted unlawful exclusions. Uh, this, of course, was not the first uh, report where we saw these concerns being raised, and ABLE um, raised this in their report, included in the main. And it's very clear that right across the country, there is a problem very specifically in this area, with many good teachers, good schools, and proactive parents struggling to work in partnership to ensure that young people access their legal right to an education. We also have to ask ourselves, what principle are we putting first? When the presumption of mainstreaming is, as other, while the presumption of mainstreaming is, while others have said, very important and noble, I do think that we can't just disregard what's in the best interests of a child or young person. And I believe that true inclusion is about listening to what young people and parents themselves are asking for. And I find all too often, again, in my own constituency work, that people are crying out for help. Yeah. They often find that the type of support being offered through mainstreaming or even within their local, local authority is inadequate and doesn't meet their needs. I think we have to be willing to listen uh, and to approach these very complex issues with an open mind and work hard to find the best solution. I also think we need to trust our professionals and listen to what they're saying. Teachers and specialists are identifying clear issues as Mary Fee uh, and others have highlighted. And I think we need to think of inclusion not just as something which happens in school, uh, because I'm very well aware uh, from my work with young people that there are some people who find uh, that the idea of getting very intensive support for a short period of time, even if that means that they are being, uh, in some senses, excluded by not being in a mainstream setting, uh, they, they believe that it's more important that they get the right support in the short term so that in the long term uh, they can get the advantage of being more included in society by fulfilling their potential um, and uh, by, able, by being able to access opportunities in the workplace. And I say that um, because we have to find the right balance. Sometimes being excluded uh, from a mainstream setting in the short term to access specialist support uh, can offer more in the long term. In conclusion, presiding officer, we've heard today that there is great, a great deal of positive practice uh, to build on. Uh, but we cannot simply ignore the issues highlighted right across this chamber. And no one has said these issues are easy. Uh, we must be willing to embrace the challenges um, and, or things will not get better. Inaction and simply saying that we have noble policies in place is not enough. I commend the Scottish Conservative motion uh, to the chamber. Thank you. Uh, that concludes the debate on the presumption to mainstream and it's time to move on to the next item of business. And I'm aware that I'm hurrying you all up, please, because we are already late starting for this next debate. So if you could change places quickly. <laughs>